The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Hi, I'm David, and welcome to the Electronics Inside, the show where we take apart toys, tools, and appliances just to see what's inside. Today, I'm going to be taking apart a 1979 toy called a Big Track. Not only that, but we've also got its 2010 reproduction. The Big Track toy was originally meant to be a bit of an educational aid. It's designed to teach programming, and you can program it to do very simple things, forwards, back, left, right, a little bit like a program called Logo that was used um, to teach sort of sequential thinking and functions. You can also ask it to trigger an accessory using the accessory port here on the top of both models. Uh, it also has a flashing light at the front and also has a speaker for sound. I think I'm going to start with the 2010 model, so let's put the 1979 model to one side. So this lovely little toy has already brought a lot of joy to uh, my house. Hold, I never had one of these growing up. We did have a similar kind of thing at school. Same kind of idea of a programmable robot, uh, and it could kind of hold a pen and you could um, draw shapes on the floor with it as it went. The thing that I remember hating about those wasn't necessarily playing with it, it was the fact it took those massive, big, chunky batteries. You know the ones with the two spring terminals on top? I can't remember if they're six or 12 volts, but they were very temperamental and took forever to charge, and I think we spent more time charging the batteries than anything else. With both these models, the driven wheel is the center wheel. You can see it's attached to a gearbox. Um, it's actually one of the big differences between the two models and how I found when I was searching for these, I could tell the difference was to try and get a photo of the underside. There's a massive gearbox on the 1971 version, whereas this is uh, very flat. Um, throughout this, I'm kind of expecting to see a lot of manufacturing differences between the 79 model and the 2010 model. I suspect that the 2010 model has been built to a price not quite in the same way the original one was. I think material technology and techniques of manufacture have improved, but largely to sort of improve manufacturability and lower the unit cost. Okay, now we've got the top half separated from the bottom. You can see inside we've got two ribbons coming to the expansion port, the on-off switch, and a ribbon for the control pad. Here's that expansion port. Now that's one of the differences that I already know about between the 79 model and the current model. So bear that in mind and we'll come back to it. The last thing holding the top half of the chassis on is the zebra cable to the keypad. It's a little 10, 10 core, I'm assuming it's matrixed. And there we go, that's the top half separated. And this just screwed down holding the end of that cable flat onto the pads on the PCB. A little rubber grommet inside. That strikes me as a good point to investigate as a fault finding mission if your keypad's not working. So at the front we've got the speaker and the LED. In this case I'm not sure if that's a blue LED, it may well be. It's on behind blue plastic. Uh, on the original version my 79 model is missing the uh, that little blue diffuser but behind it you can see that it's a proper little six volts light bulb. So with this one we can see that it, the battery it just takes three D cells which are these massive beefy jobs which means it's, the whole thing runs on 4.5 volts. Uh, I can't see any obvious sign of regulators, which means the motors, the circuitry, everything's 4.5 volts or lower. So getting close to the end of this one, try and remove the gearbox from the bottom. I find it interesting on the circuit board that you've got a pair of potted um, processors, but they're on a daughter board, they're on a slightly separate board which must mean that they've had to manufacture those somewhere else and then sold them onto the PCB, sort of negating the cost benefit of having them as a package glopped off anyway. If you know the benefit of doing that, you'll have to let me know because I can't fathom it out. There's one more thing I want to investigate. It's gonna be really hard for me to explain because it's something I can feel. Now, when I try and turn the motors, they want to turn together. So I'm not sure whether there's gonna be something like a differential inside or whether it's actually an electronic thing where it, by turning one motor you're inducing enough voltage that it sort of overcomes the friction of the other motor. We'll have to see. Always one screw. There we go. Here is the gearbox. These two little black parts here, 
they're magnets. And you see if I move one, the other one's magnetically attracted to it. That's a really useful thing to see uh, because when we're driving the two, D the two DC motors, there's no guarantee that they're going to rotate at exactly the same speed. Just the, the inherent friction and other components. It's not like a stepper motor where you've got the angle rotation and pulse counting. So you need to make sure it drives straight forward to have those two motors synchronized. And they've chosen to do that using, I don't know if I describe that as a magnetic differential or maybe it's a magnetic clutch. Either way, if I turn these two together, you see that the motors want to spin with those magnets facing each other. And to drive a corner, you can see the motors sort of cog as the magnets attract and repel. And that's how it turns one way or the other. So the motors have only got to overcome the force of those magnets to be able to turn a corner. It's a neat little design. The other thing I'm curious, there you go. Down in the bottom here, there are sets of light gates, which when paired up with these gears, which have got perforations in them, provide feedback to the circuit board so it knows how many rotations and how many pulses of light, in this case, it's travelled forward and that enables it to sort of count and calculate how far forward and how far left and right it's gone, which is just the same as uh, an old school mouse with a ball. Um, if you take one of those apart, the ball rubs up against a little axis which has got a big wheel on the end with all the perforations just like these. Now let's see how that compares to the 1979 model. Now, the first obvious difference that most of you will have already spotted by now is this. It's got a nine volt battery and four D cells in the bottom, which is very, very different from the modern version, which just required three D cells. So that one had a maximum of 4.5 volts, whereas this one has access to six volts in the D cells and potentially another nine volts, whether that's parallel or series or completely separate, I don't know. So this could in theory be up to 15 volts. That doesn't seem very standard. I'm imagining they're kept separate for the motor driving and probably the power the processors. So let's see how we get in here. I'm a little surprised by this. I kind of thought the new one would have a lower build quality, whereas the 1979 one instantly you can see that the wheels aren't screwed on, they're just pushed on with clips over the bars and then the wheels slide over the axles. And uh, just for si size comparison, if I compare the 1979 to the 2010 sidebars, you can see how different the wheelbase is. They look very, very similar side by side. I think you'd struggle to tell the difference, but the original version is ever so slightly smaller. I'll just show you the battery compartment, which takes up an extraordinary amount of space by comparison. So you've got the four D cells, but the depth, because they're standing vertically rather than lying flat, it's just a big difference. No, I think this has kind of uh, got some nicer details than the modern one. Uh, the fact that the screws are hidden under there, on the new one they're just cosmetic, which I guess is, a, as I said, it's a step towards cheaper buildability. Here is a lovely little detail on the front. These two little terminals here, they are push fit locking terminals. Um, all you do is just sort of lift up these little plastic sheaths like that and you can lift out the wires. Nice, easy installation, although I bet those cost a little bit of money. One of the big differences between the 79 model and the 2010 model is the auxiliary port or the, the accessory module. On the new one, it actually uses an infrared LED just to strobe and to show and to trigger the accessory into doing whatever it's to do, whether that's start, stop or take a photo with a camera. However, this old one uses a three and a half millimeter jack, uh, just a two pole one bolted in the top. So I don't know, but I guess in theory the old one could have supplied power as well, whereas the new one can't, so any accessory needs batteries. A little lock ring off. Okay, now we can see the important bits. Ah, that's interesting. So rather than just having that 9 volt and 6 volts from the AA, from the D cells, actually they've got multiple tappings on there. I think it's supplying 3 volts, 6 volts and 9 volts. Interesting. Again, you've got the same ribbon cable as you have on the modern equivalent and the same keypad layout. Be interesting to find out if actually you could replace an old one with a new one. So last thing is to remove the old PCB and we should be done. And there we have everything inside a 1979 Big Track and a 2010 Big Track. I have to say I'm surprised. The buildability, uh, the quality and the materials all seem remarkably similar. Uh, a couple of minor changes with how the wheels are held on. Uh, I would 
definitely say that the 2010 is quicker to build. Uh, this one strikes me as a little more fiddly and the extra voltages in the battery compartments, they're a legacy of the requirements of the circuit board, but they make a lot of sense. Aside from the wheels, the cosmetics, the chassis, the really interesting stuff all happens in the gearboxes and the circuit boards. So let's clear everything else and take a look. Okay, with the two gearboxes apart, you can see a few things that have stayed very, very similar between the two models. Uh, very high, very big reduction in speed, which gives you a lot of torque out of those tiny little DC motors. Um, interesting that this black gear has got the perforations on it and uh, if you see where that sat you can see that they were using the little light gates, the little transmitter receiver, even back in 1979 to do pulse counting for calculating how long it will take. The only thing I will say is the 79 version has only got a single light gate so it was only measuring one side so all the time it was going straight that's fine but when it was turning a corner left or right it can only have measured the one side and assumed that the two were similar so i think this would have been less accurate at matching angles precisely than the modern version which has got the two light gates however it's nice to see that this little clutch detail uh, or the, the magnetic differential has remained the same within the two in terms of the circuitry and the manufacture of the circuit boards i mean the modern version is surface mount components it's probably wave soldered but there's nothing particularly challenging. But you compare that to the 1979 board, uh, everything's through hole. This is potentially hand soldered. I can't really see evidence for or against, but I do love the fact that they managed to get their, their custom mark on the traces in the PCB on the underside, which presumably nobody would have ever seen. But it's a lovely board, really nicely made. So on here we have the Texas Instruments processor, which did most of the work. And then we had a little RAM chip just to hold your 16 line program. I've really enjoyed seeing the difference that 40 years of manufacturing and technology has made to these machines. I'm surprised at how much is still really similar or even the same. If you've got an idea for something you'd like to see torn down, let us know over at the Element 14 community. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.